My name is Jack Thompson. I'm the superintendent of Perry Local Schools and welcome to the second of a series of videos that we will be doing to try to answer some of the frequently asked questions that we hear from our community. Uh, today I'm happy to have Dr. Betty Jo Malczewski with us and we're going to be talking a little bit about our grading practices and uh, some of us may wonder with uh, the excellent history of Perry Local Schools. Um, we've been preparing students uh, uh, for the world of work and uh, college for many years and had great success with that. Uh, why in the world will we go and try to change something like grading practices that have been done for hundreds and hundreds of years um, the same way, meaning that, you know, we kind of understand when kids get an A, they're doing excellent, and when kids are getting a B, they're doing good. So why would we work to change any of those things? The reason why we would change this is because what we found over time is while we generally know a student that gets an A is excellent, we don't really specifically know where in their learning and what skills and abilities they are able to do as a result of the experience they've had at Perry. So the idea of changing our grading practices is simply to get better every day, and try to provide a better story for our students to understand where they are in their learning and what they may need to do to get better. And the more specific we can be in that practice, the better our students are going to be able to grow and learn and know where they're heading down whatever story or pathway they choose right. um, for a career or college. So with that in mind, uh, Dr. Betty Jo Malczewski, <laughs> Take us through um, what has been the last couple years in our preparation um, for the differences we are now seeing in our grading practices. Yeah, prior to even you and I here at Perry, Perry was really on his nice march to studying why standards-based grading and had a lot of um, clear understanding on it. We just didn't quite do anything about it just yet. The three things what we're really trying to achieve is just that when we give students feedback on their learning, that it's really clear to them where they are in their learning what we're trying to learn, A. Secondly, is that we want to be responsive. If we're not quite there in a student's learning, where am I today and how can I get better? We also are very aware that there's students who come to our classrooms who may already have that information and that understanding of what we're about to teach well before they sat down. And so we're wanting to be very clear of them using our assessment practices, how we quiz kids and look at how they're doing in their learning to say, hey, we have students already here to have met what's next for them. Tell me why it's still important for students to do their homework. Homework is the practice of what has already been learned. Homework is not to give new information that hasn't been learned and, and have students gruel over it at night. So the purpose of homework is, is if I'm not quite there in my learning, I needed to sharpen my saw. I needed to get better and to practice what's not quite secure or in our district what we call not proficient. Mm -hmm. We were able to uncover what can our community, what do we believe, what does our community believe we can tolerate in terms of what weight homework should be, what do we value. And we came to an agreement through parent coffees and also through what, for what our teachers were experiencing. We said it's going to come from 90 percent tests but 10 percent from what I did in my homework. So as, as I take a test where I have to perform or demonstrate maybe it's a formula or a problem, um, what am I hoping to see that's different as I look at how the feedback I'm getting from the teacher, in other words, uh, maybe I do a problem that takes me a good 30, 35 minutes and as a result of one careless mistake early on in the process, in the past I might have gotten a zero credit on that. Has that changed and will I see some different kind of feedback in my test as a result of our, our shift in the grading practices? Yes, it's our hope that you see clearly that this test is made up of these large areas. So for example, when you and I may have gone to school and had a test, we may have seen a score at the top, some X's in red, maybe me more than you, you more than me, <laughs> but we had some red on our paper in terms of we knew we got it wrong, but we didn't know what we needed to do to improve. What we're hoping to see in our test now is they're actually organized in a manner that this portion of what I show you is about, for example, linear, linear equations. This one is about this section of what we learned, and this portion is this, so that when I do have an area that I'm not strong in, it clearly can tell me, oh, I'm great with the linear equation portion, but I'm really poor at explaining, you know, why this mathematical mm -hmm. process is and how it would change in real life. When it, and we have kids that that's very common. For example, in the, the example I just mentioned is that I can solve a problem, I can crunch numbers, but to explain how this impacts a problem in real world, 
I falter there. So that's the area that we need to lift and get better at in the classroom and relearn, reteach, and, and improve upon. And so how does that differ now? Because it used to be a culmination of all the things I do get to me to my grade. Now, once I've shown that, mm -hmm. um, and it's no longer a 79% correct or an 87% correct, how is that different on the grading reporting as far as what I see on a report card? Right. So we always hope that kids have multiple attempts to show what we know and that we're not always great the first time that we show like a driving test. So on a given day, when we have another attempt at it later on in the grade book or later on in the uh, unit, we actually have kids that hopefully are showing growth and we don't want to penalize them from what at the time that they didn't know it. So what you will see differently than, than past practice is what we call dropped. We may drop some past evidence because the real picture of learning is what they know today. So talk to us a little bit about the, there are two methodologies that we use in the district, points or marks. Mm -hmm. As simple as we can, explain what's the difference between a teacher that's using points and a teacher that's using marks. With rubrics in all classrooms, we're able, we have teachers that say, I want to work solely within that rubric and any given day at the, when we're learning or when we're assessing, I'm going to score them within the rubric. I'm going to actually underline maybe the things that aren't quite there yet so it calls to the attention. We've also given our teachers the opportunity that if the rubric still remains in the classroom but you want to take your assessments and grade them by points in each, sec in each section, you certainly can. So getting back to the math test that we mentioned where the linear equation sample was above and we had a different set of math um, learning targets below, the teacher can say that this linear equation section is worth 10 points. The child got an 8 and you might see an 8 out of 10 in that section. In this next new concept in math, the student may have gotten a 10 out of 10. You see that's actually perfect work. And then the third one is not. So it's giving the teachers the opportunity to learn, use points and enter those in, but in the grade book we as parents, we as educators are going to see that when the student got 100, perfect means advanced. You actually have We've done everything we've expected you to do, and you're actually in the advanced um, realm. The 8 out of the 10 actually is in the in progress. So even though I put my 8 in the grade book, it's going to keep showing you that on the rubric that's in progress. We're not quite there yet. And one of the positive outcomes um, for not only this shift, but our shift from doing a grade point average that has typically been a comparison with other, other students is now we're really going to focus on the individual mm -hmm. and their learning mm -hmm. and not compare them to their peers where we get into a situation where there might be some competitiveness and some ranking where we feel that might be an unhealthy environment to really allow kids to learn at their pace and a level that's going to help them maximize their um, performance and their achievement. Yeah. Uh, so you want to explain a little bit more about the, the Val Sal piece and what we're doing as a district there? A year ago, Principal Porcello uh, met with community and parents and we really talked about um, looking at our past practice of using anonymous students and their progress over time. Who on this page should be the Val Sal? And every person in the room had a different opinion of why this person, this student A versus student Z, should be the Val Sal, whether it's because an opinion was made this one is taking more uh, college courses and no, no, this one's staying at the high school and taking advanced placement courses. So it was a real different, we could really see across the room that what is valedictorian, what is salutatorian, do we agree in, in, that it, it's, it's kind of a messy process? And to rank a student one, two, three, four in their class when really we're looking at five excellent, top-notch, hardworking, ready-for-the-world students, are we doing the right thing? And so we started talking about aren't there benchmarks that we're trying to move all, toward, all students towards that are trying to earn the highest level of, of graduation. And that was the decision that I think the, the community and the team came out with with Mr. Porcello is that effective with the class of 2020, um, we are going to be looking at the removal of, a, of, of those two designations and making sure that our students of distinction um, our students that have attained these benchmarks that the community defined. So um, we're not the first high school to have these discussions. There's a lot of track record of, of communities that believe pitting kids number one, two, three, four against each other um, 
was was not in the best practice and and we met with our community last year and I believe that's why the recommendation was made for the class of 2020. I so appreciate the work that you've done and our entire staff has done to while we go through these changes and we adjust and adapt one thing that I remain confident is is that our kids are going to continue to grow and achieve mm -hmm. at uh, outstanding levels mm -hmm. and we're going to continue to provide uh, opportunities for our kids to do things that are going to make us very very proud yeah. of their achievements and accomplishments yeah. and so um, I would like to thank you for your time uh, with me today Dr. Malczewski and thank you for watching. If you have any questions regarding some of the things we talked about here today or any other questions involving the curriculum at Perry Schools please feel free to call or email Dr. Malczewski or myself and either of us will be happy to speak with you. Thank you and go Pirates!